Welcome to the Property Management Mastermind Show with your host, Brad Larson. Brad owns one of the fastest growing property management companies in San Antonio, Texas. This podcast is for property managers by property managers. You'll hear from industry leading professionals on best practices, new ideas, success stories, and lessons learned. This is your opportunity to learn about the latest industry buzz surrounding property management, as well as tips and strategies to improve your business. Now here's your host, Brad Larson. Today's show is sponsored by the National Property Management Network, providing insurance products and services to property managers such as tenant liability insurance. Visit them at nationalpropertymanagement.com. In today's episode of Property Management Mastermind, episode 12, we'll be talking to Amy Carnes. Now, in this interview, I wanted you to understand that Amy has bought and sold and started other property management companies. And she started in San Antonio. She built that company up, ended up selling that company, and did what we all kind of dream about in a certain way is moving to a new market and starting from scratch with all the lessons learned, setting up a company to exact specifications on how you want to do it and making it run like a top because of all that experience you had from the previous companies. And towards the end, you're going to hear one of the things that's really fascinating is how she turned the unaccompanied showing systems into a giant revenue generator and how she's doing that and why it's working for her. So this is going to be a good interview. And here we go with Amy. And Amy, thanks for joining us in Studio Day for the Property Management Mastermind. How are you? I am doing fantastic. Thank you for having me. And you came in today from Dallas, just a big one one day trip. One day, fly down, fly back. Awesome. So thanks for coming on. As I've talked to you before, I wanted to get you onto the, to the podcast show here so we can talk about some things that you've done in the past. As I mentioned in the intro, you're a 20-year veteran. You've been doing property management for a long time now. You've seen things inside, outside, front and back from different perspectives, and that's what we wanted to hear about. So Give us a few minutes about some of your background and your history. Okay. Well, I started out as a realtor in a regular residential company, and the opportunity came up for me to purchase that company from the owners who were looking at retiring. Both of the co-owners had turned 65, and they were looking to make a change in their their lifestyle, so they were ready to, to move out of the industry. Um, But they weren't ready to go quite yet. So we had worked it out. This was back in 2006. Mm -hmm. We worked out a five-year transition plan to where each year I would take over more of the company and they would work to get one step closer to retirement. Okay. So it worked out uh, very nicely. At the time, they had 90 properties. They had 14 agents and one staff member in some leased space down on Bandera Road. And uh, we got together, we did have an an attorney draw up a purchase agreement uh, in order to transition their 100 shares of stock over to me Mm -hmm. over the five-year period. And so each year I would buy another uh, set of stock and each year they would go from working five days a week to four days a week to three days a week. And it worked out to where they could work their way into retirement and I could work my way up on taking over the company. So, you know, that's an interesting model. I've not heard that talked about too much. Typically, you're going to hear somebody acquiring a company from either a multiple of revenue, correct, or some sort of multiple of EBITDA, which is the bottom line, the, the, the profits. But for that to do a 10-year type of a, a structure, that's really interesting. So how you just stumbled upon that? Because you were doing sales and it just kind of fell in your lap? Yeah, I had known the people for a long time and I was looking to make a change. And so I actually had contacted them and asked them if they were looking at some point in the future to sell. And it was just everything lined up at the same time. They had just met with a attorney to convert it from a partnership to a LLC. And uh, once they converted it to an LLC, they were you know, positioned to be able to start selling off portions of the stock. And they could do a stock purchase or stock sale at that point versus like an asset sale. Correct. That's why they converted it from a partnership to an LLC. Correct. Okay. Just want to be clear on that. That's really fascinating because uh, also the 10 year design on that, that's pretty interesting. So who came up with that idea? Five five years. Five years. Five years. Yeah. Um, Well, it it kind of worked both ways because they weren't necessarily ready to retire. um, And they were financing it for me. So I didn't have to come up with all of the cash up front. So I was able to buy it in, in chunks and pieces 
instead of having to buy it all at once. So it, it just kind of was what worked for the buyer and the seller. It worked for both of us. And we'd known, we had worked together for many, many years. So there was a comfort level there. Mm -hmm. So that made it even easier. So essentially it was like you acquired 20% every year for Correct. five years. Okay. Correct. That makes it easy mm -hmm. for me to understand because you start talking shares and stocks. And I'm like, oh, Wall Street, oh, yeah. stick a knife in my eye. I don't want to yeah. know about Wall Street. No, it made it really easy. And then it was very easy to determine uh, what ownership percentage you were at. So the way that we did it is that each month we would take the profit, we would take out a set amount for the operating expenses for the following month, and then we would split the profit based upon our, our we would do profit sharing. So if I own 20%, then that month I got 20% of the profits. Mm -hmm. So each year as I acquired more shares, my check and my profit share would change based upon my percentage of ownership. So it worked out really well. There was not a... Um, uh, set amount that uh, they were going to receive or I was going to receive because we did the the profit sharing model. Okay. Now the, the money's easy to understand. What about the control side? Were there any issues there because you have an outgoing potential owner, an incoming new person who's got fired up ideas? Uh, did you see any clashes or challenges there? On the purchase, for me, it was um, really helpful to have the owners there because he had been a broker for 20 plus years. And I had come out of just being a manager and being a property manager and being an office manager. So taking off the manager hat and putting on the owner hat, um, there was a lot for me to learn. Uh, so it was nice to be able to have them there to show me how to run a property management company, how to work with the agents and, and do a lot of the day-to-day the -day operation stuff that you, you might not do as a manager, taking care of employees and paying payroll taxes and filing income taxes and depreciating assets within the company, all of that stuff that, that you would do on the ownership side. So it, for me, it was really helpful to have them there. Um, the, uh, the culture and the kind of the environment that I was working in with them, it was a family-owned company. Mm -hmm. It was a very small, what we would consider, you know, a mom-and-pop corporation. And so they were very open and receptive to new ideas on, on making some changes you know, at that time, back in 2006, we were still using Excel spreadsheets for doing our owner statements. So <laughs> we were, we, had, we, we grew a lot, you know, since then, but um, in inquiring software and moving to online portals and such, none of that existed back in 2006. So there was lots of opportunity to, to grow and change as new things came up in the market. That's awesome. Um, one of the things I want to talk to you about too is how long did you run that company? So I ran it for 10 years. And, okay. and you started at roughly 90 doors. 90 properties, yes. Okay. And then you built it up to a level of? 225 doors okay. in 10 years. Okay. And did you consider yourself very profitable in doing that? I would consider it a very profitable operation. Yeah. It was very lean. Yeah, yeah. Um, and some of that leanness came from uh, after I bought the company in 2006, or I, per I bought into it, we had the the fallout in 2007 and 2008. Mm -hmm. So in those years, we had to be lean yes. or you'd go out of business. And so it, it was kind of hindsight's 2020. It was a great opportunity for us to become lean. And then once you get into that habit, you stay lean. Yeah. And so staying lean. And then, of course, in 2009 and 2010, our numbers went through the roof. Uh, we couldn't sign up properties fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, you know, our, our profit doubled when you know, we just brought on a few properties. So it, it was it was really a blessing to have to go through the, the downside of, of real estate. But yeah, some of the most profitable as far as percentage wise companies are often the smaller ones in that 150, 200, 250 door range because they've kind of found their, their niche. They're okay with who they are. They're not trying to be somebody super small. They're not trying to be somebody super big. They're just kind of right there making a good profit. I think that's very wise. So you manage it for 10 years. You own it for 10 years. And now all of a sudden, okay, where did the prompt to potentially sell that particular model business come from? I mean, what, what caused you to look at even selling it? Okay. Well, great question. Um, I really, I wasn't looking to sell it. And I had a, um, an offer that came in, a, uh, a blind offer that came from another company that was looking to pick up the property management side. I was hesitant about selling it because I did not want to break up the property management versus the sales versus the, the building. Um, there were 
and at the time I had the HOA business as well. So, so back up a bit, explain okay. to the, the listeners that you own that building as well. Yeah. So it makes one more little, uh, you know, tricky part of this <laughs> even more, more fun. Absolutely. When I first purchased the company in 2006, they were leasing uh, 1,500 square feet down on Bandera Road, and they had been there for 20 years. And uh, the lease was coming up, and the previous owners had told me, Amy, if there was one thing we would do differently, it would have been to buy a building because we could have paid for it by now. And they said, you really need to buy a building. And so I met with our CPA, and the CPA said, you know, one of the best things you can do is buy the building in your name, and lease it back to the company. Mm -hmm. So um, I found a, an office space out at, in Holotus that worked out perfectly for our needs, and I was able to purchase it. My payment went was half of what we were paying in rent at our previous location. Don't for glaze over that. <laughs> Let's say that again, everybody. Go over that one more time. So those of you thinking about renting or buying, and, and we're in the same boat, we're still renting right now, but we want to buy, say that one more time real okay. slow. So the old office was 1,500 square feet, and our rental payment was double what our mortgage payment was on the new building. And the new building, the beautiful thing about owning it yourself is you lease it back to the company, mm -hmm. and you can lease it at market rate. Well, the market rate was double what my mortgage was. So it was, for <laughs> me, you know, another revenue stream, so you, personally. That's, that's a big deal, because uh, I don't even want to rehash those numbers because it'll make me mad. But essentially, that's a genius move. I think that should not be overlooked. That's why I had to put the brakes on. Let's go over that again because yeah. we forget about that. Yeah. We're like, all right, let's go, let's go rent some space and run business and go. And then we forget about, wait a minute, I need to turn around and buy this puppy so I'm not having to deal with this. And that's exactly how you set it up from what I understand. So you own the building. Yes. And then you lease that back to the management company at market rate, and that market rate might be double your mortgage. Correct. As it was with you. Correct. So right there, they made a really, you had a really good profit stream right there. Uh, excellent point to bring up. So I, I ruined your train of thought. So that's go okay. back and start no, talking okay. about the selling side. The, the other beautiful thing of owning your own space, of course, like it is with, with regular rental property, is the depreciation is there. The appreciation is there. Um, and you have a lot more flexibility of not being confined within the lease parameters of the landlord, of mm -hmm. course. So, yeah, I would highly, highly, highly recommend it. If there's any way that you can find a way to make it work, um, do it. Just just do it. It's, it was absolutely excellent. So, yes, but it did make it a little bit more complicated because when it was time to sell, I had the building that I was leasing back to the company. I wanted to sell. I was offered to purchase the property management side. Then I had the agent side, and then I had the, at that time, the HOA side. So I, I did end up selling the HOA business separately, um, but I had talked to people over the years, you know, at various NARPM conventions and property management meetings, and people often talk about, oh, you know, if I could buy accounts, I would buy accounts, or if I could buy a, another company, I would buy another company. And I, I'd had a relationship with some people that had mentioned that to me many times before. And so I actually approached them and told them, hey, I have this offer on the table to purchase the property management business, but it's not something that I'm, I'm interested in doing, but it got me to think, hey, if, if I could find somebody that wanted to buy the property management side and the agent side, you know, the employees, the staff, everything, and take over the lease, you know, that might be something that I would be interested in doing. So a buyer came to you and said, here's the offer on the table, and you kind of looked around and said, basically found one of your peers, and said, I've got this offer on the table. I want to talk to you about potentially matching it and beating it. Right. Okay. Right. And so um, the, uh, the other problem was the first offer that I had received was someone who, it was another real estate company. They did not do property management, but they wanted to start a property management company. Ah. So they wanted to buy the accounts, but they wanted me to go with them to manage those accounts and teach them how to do property management for six months or a year, which was another wrinkle in it because I couldn't do that and still manage the agents and still manage the building. So that that just that model was not going to work for my particular business. So I did I reached out to one of my peers and I said, hey, I have this offer on the table, and you know I'm not going to take it, but you know it got me thinking, you know maybe I should look at, you know maybe there are some options for me to sell it. And they said, absolutely. We think that, you know, you have a, a great system. You, you are organized. The, the processes and procedures are in place. You've got written policies. Every, all the agents are trained. Everybody knows what their job roles are. We would love to take a look at it. And so um, I had always been told, you know, the biggest question I get asked a lot is, well, how do you figure out 
what the purchase price is. You know, you, how do you pull that rabbit out of the hat and determine sure. a, a number? And just in, in many, many years of talking about this to a number of different property management people, I was always under the impression that if someone was going to pay cash for accounts, um, then you could expect as a seller to receive one year's management fees for those accounts if you were going to sell them for cash. If you were willing to finance them, you could sell them for two or even three times one year's management fees. Right. And so we used that approach um, in setting this, this purchase agreement up for me to sell to the buyers. They wanted to do a down payment plus you know yearly payments. Uh, so I was able to get two years management fees for which those. Is, which is kind of unusual because in a lot of businesses, they're selling for a multiple of revenue. And what you're talking about is management fees. Because mm -hmm. revenue, you, you forget all the sundries, you forget all the late fees, all the other fees that go into the revenue side, the maintenance fees, all that stuff that goes into the, to the company's top line. But you're talking management fees only. The only recurring revenue in that total business is the management fee, correct? correct. And so they're offering potentially one times management fee, which may only be half of your revenue. True. In some, in some in cases. Some cases yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it depends on how you're set up. I mean, there are a number of companies that are very fee driven. And there are some that are more percentage driven. And, you know, every company does it a little, a little differently. Uh, we were more percentage driven than fee driven. So it worked out, you know, for, for me to sell based upon a, the factor of the management fees. So you decided to sell at that point. You had an offer on the table. You got another offer in from a competing buyer who you knew personally. And you, at that point, there was no advertising. So you never had to go into a business broker or biz buy sell or anything like that. Didn't have to go to a business broker, just kind of the word of mouth advertising. And that seems to be the norm in most cases in most management companies around. So at that point, you guys went forward with a letter of intent or how did you do this in writing? How did you go, go there? Yeah, um, we actually, um, I had the purchase agreement from when I purchased the company. Okay. So we kind of had a, a boilerplate to start from um, to be able to say, hey, this, this worked last time, so maybe we could make it work this time. The difference was that in this particular case, I had decided that if I was going to sell and we did include a do not comp uh, non-compete clause for uh, the local county, um, if I was going to sell, I was looking at making a move and making a move to another, you know, a new market. And so the non-compete was for a year, 10 years, forever? Three years. Three years. And in that county, in Bear County only? For Bear County. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Just yeah. want to be clear about that. Uh, some people always question, are non-competes actually enforceable? You know, especially, you've always heard this conversation, mm -hmm. but I think they are, especially if you're going into it with goodwill. So same letter of intent, did you have an exclusivity in there? Be basically meaning you're going to only deal with that particular buyer at that point for a number of days? Um, you know, I had known these people for a very long time, and I feel like once you've made the deal, you stick with the deal. So it's more of a handshake It's a, more of a concept. handshake deal. So we sat down, we said, you know, here's what I'd like to do. Would you be interested? Yes, I'd be interested. Well, let's work out the fine details. Here's a sample agreement. Let's work through this. I never offered it to anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, now, I would have, possibly, had this not worked out, but they were very eager to purchase it. We were able to, you know, there was some negotiation on, on pricing and terms, et cetera. But uh, it went extremely smooth. Okay. We set a closing date for January 1st. I did offer and agree to stay on as a consultant for six months okay. um, with no additional um, compensation. Because I, you know, I put my heart and soul into this company for 10 years. I wanted to see them succeed. It was, it was my goal for them to succeed. Mm -hmm. And so we had put that into the, into the agreement. And um, so there were no other, I never, yeah, you're right. I never advertised it. I never went out to a business broker. We never had it appraised, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, it worked for me. It worked for them. And so. That's all that's needed. That's all that's really needed. Yeah. So talk us through some of the base terms that you're comfortable in, in sharing with us. Uh, so you have a letter of intent, which could be an agreement, purchase agreement, sure. or at least some sort of guidelines, some sort of written email, some sort of napkin that says, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this, this, this. Talk us through some of that as much as you feel comfortable with. Sure. Well, we set it up in the same way that I had purchased it. We decided that there would be a hundred shares of stock okay. and that the total purchase price would be X. And so they could buy it in whichever increments they wanted to. Um, 
but I really didn't want, you know, I, I had heard about people doing five years and 10 year purchase agreements. I really wasn't interested in, in dragging this out real long, but I do understand that being able to sell or finance it always, you know, makes it easier for people to purchase things. So we agreed on a three year term with a uh, significant down payment and then monthly payments every year with a larger monthly payment at the end of each year. Okay. Um, and then at the end of the third year, then 100%, those 100 shares will have been completely transferred over to the new buyers. And the price was not dependent on any sort of uh, performance of the company still, even with your absence. That's correct. And okay. I think that was... That's um, an important point. That That is an important point. And I hear that a lot within property management circles that, well, what happens if half the owners leave the day after you, know, you, you buy the company? And I... I understand that and I see that from a, a buyer's perspective. I think now that um, I've been through it as a buyer and as a seller, I probably have a little bit of a different perspective on it that I it really depends on how is your company set up? Who is the day-to-day -day contact for those owners and for those accounts? And for our company, for many, many years, that was me. Well, when we got to the point where we had you know 150 plus properties, it couldn't be me anymore. And so I hired the right staff and I had the right people in the right seats mm -hmm. to be able to be that day-to-day -day contact. And as the years went by, I was less and less involved with the owners and the tenants and I was more involved in managing the employees who were the day-to-day -day contacts. Okay. So when it came time for me to step aside, all of the management agreements were in the company name. And so the, there was really zero impact to the owner. Um, they were still had the same contact at the company. They still had the same tenant in their property. Really, there was no change to them. So there wasn't a huge um, opportunity for losing a bunch of accounts just because I was being removed from the, the picture. Mm -hmm. um, from the seller's side, I, I understand that, you know, now that I see it from the seller's side, Depending on how the transition takes place from the buyer and how those the businesses run after the sale has a significant impact into being able to retain or lose those accounts. Mm -hmm. And so there I think there, you know, a lot of people have said, well, I want to be able to pay based upon how many accounts I retain, and they put that as a seller obligation and making sure that the seller doesn't mess up losing those accounts. But I think it's equally as important that the buyer has a responsibility to maintain those accounts. Yeah, the buyer could come in and dissolve it. It could be a strategic acquisition. They could come in and just, you know, <laughs> what's the term I'm looking for I can use on the radio? They could, they could make the bed get dirty and just let everybody go out the door. So I'm curious, so before we get to that point too, is, is uh, the closing, how did that work? I mean, as far as, you know, you close on a home, you close on a business, you mm -hmm. close on a commercial building, you go to a title company, you go to an attorney, you sit down, and you sign paperwork. How'd that work for you guys? How'd you end up doing that? Well, we had had the um, original purchase agreement. And of course, you know, we went through three or four different revisions, tweaks and changes to it. And then once we were all comfortable with it, we actually set a closing date in the purchase agreement. And then we sat down and we signed it and notarized it together. They made their down payment as part of that mm -hmm. January 1st date. And that was what we consider to be the closing date and basically day one of their ownership. Perfect. So very informal, you know, not no attorneys, no anything like that. Perfect. No. Uh, and maybe you had some attorney review of the packets, of the, of the purchase packets, potentially? We did not because we had spent so much time and money doing that when I bought it. Mm -hmm. um, and having been through that, we I kind of knew what worked and what didn't work. Yeah. So had I not had that experience and had I not had that as a, as a resource, I probably would definitely encourage people to have an attorney review it as a, as a buy-sell agreement, um, making sure that they know exactly when the stock transfers, mm -hmm. how that transfers, and then what happens if um, the buyer defaults. Yeah. You know, at that point, you know, on a corporation side, we set that up to where if by chance the buyer does default, then there's stock ownership and you, go, you revert back to a profit share model of the stock ownership. But hoping and praying that all of it goes through and that the, the buyer completes the purchase and the 100% of the stock transfers. Yeah, great point there is just go ahead and have an attorney review it. You're yes. looking at 1000 or 2000 yep. in, in attorney's cost to do that. And if the other side balks at that, that's a huge red flag. Yeah. You know, what are they trying to hide from you or what are they trying to like keep going that they don't want you to go to an attorney? Uh, anyway, I just think it's a good, good point to have. And I would think I each side should have their own attorney. 
Uh, or you can have a joint attorney just for the both because it's, it's a corporation thing. That's, that's great stuff. So are you closed, which is a, an easy process. It wasn't a dynamic thing. And, you know, you always hear the stories of people getting, you know, seven figure, eight figure paydays, but for you, it wasn't a giant, you know, end of your money payday. You're not going to go buy an Island and move away. I mean, it's not, it's not the end of everything payday. It's still like, okay, great. And then you have to move on to the next portion of your life. Mm -hmm. So at this point, the company is changing hands. I mean, you have some hold back to where you're going to be there for what, six months six or months. six months. Mm -hmm. Okay. The six months goes by and you're like, okay, now what? Now it's the next chapter of Amy's property management, real estate career, correct? Correct. So you picked correct. up and moved. I picked up and moved, went to a whole brand new market, had never been there. I only knew one person okay, in the market. Okay, stop right there. Stop right there. This is, <laughs> this is why I had you on because this is like a personal fantasy of every property management company <laughs> owner out there is to sell the company you're in and then move to like a destination part. Like we, you and I were joking before the show, I'd love to sell my company, I'm not, I'm not going to sell it, but imagine selling a company and moving to Lake Tahoe, mm -hmm. you know, and setting up a new company, someplace mm -hmm. really, really fascinating, you know, right. that everybody wants to go to or go, uh, I don't know where, where would you go if you had to live anywhere in the world? Oh goodness. Um, hmm. Well, uh, I'd probably, probably choose Phoenix or Colorado. So, yeah, so let's say yeah. Colorado, let's say Breckenridge, yeah. Colorado. Breckenridge. Right. You want to go to ski town and be yeah. a property manager. So anyway, you're moving, you moved to Dallas. I did. Dallas, Texas. Great city. Uh, loved it up there. Lots of opportunity, lots of market space up there. And so you had to run through the whole gymnastics of getting set up again. Right. And you've got 20 years experience. You got a little bit of money in the bank from the, the sale. And you're like, okay, I'm going to set this up in Dallas. So kind of talk us through how that worked out. Well, I, I chose to stay in Texas because I didn't want to deal with the licensing change of mm -hmm. having to change to an, another state. Um, I had previously, you know, moved around the world and had real estate licenses in different areas. And so I was really confined to Texas because I didn't want to deal with the licensing. But I did try to, my goal was to set it up um, to have it on a smaller scale than what I had previously done. I wanted to be a one man shop, okay. one woman shop, uh, keep it in house, be able to work from home, mm -hmm. not have the overhead of having the office and the employees and copiers and phone systems, et cetera. Um, and really do it on a smaller scale, but do it all from the cloud. Awesome. So I want to be able to generate business and work in Dallas, but I want to be able to sit on the beach in Punta Cana and uh, <laughs> collect rent and be able to manage maintenance from, from the beach anywhere. So the entire goal when I was setting it up for the new company was everything had to be able to be accessed remote, uh, everything in the cloud, everything paperless. Okay. So that was, that was the goal. And a lot of that was very easy to do because I knew what worked and what kind of didn't work in my previous roles. You know, when I first took over the company in 2006, we had a 10 by 10 storage facility full of paper. Oh, wow. That was back when uh, Texas Real Estate Commission required us to keep 10 years of everything. Yeah. And then they finally changed it to keep four years of everything. So we were able to move from a 10 by 10 storage facility to a 10 by five. <laughs> um, but we just had paper on top of paper. And so um, really making sure that the systems were in place to, to be paperless and to be virtual was, was huge. Um, there's quite a bit of expense in starting a brand new company, uh, getting licensed with the, the new company and setting up a brokerage under the licensing, joining a new board, mm -hmm. setting up all new uh, MLS access with the new board, and everything from designing the new logo, yep, new names, new names mm -hmm. setting up a corporation, bank accounts, mm -hmm. getting a accountant, setting up uh, accounting software, getting property management software, mm -hmm. all of that, you know, there's definitely a, a cost of getting all of that set up. I think that's the other part of our fantasy is because as management company owners get to have more experience, they'd always like to go back in time and say, man, I wish I would have done, done it different at that point. Yeah. You know, I could think of 20 different stories, you know, go back four or five years ago. So I should have done it this way at that point. It would have been so much better off now. And you're like, you're in the time machine now. You're like, you're like in the beginning of that time machine that right. everybody wants to be in. So it's kind of a cool, I'm like excited for you. I don't know why, but I'm super excited for you. New market set up, new licensing. Now, one of the challenges is getting leads. Getting leads. And getting leads in a new market is very, very difficult. Um, you know, I had it really easy in San Antonio because I had been here for so long and I had been so actively involved in the local board and local associations 
that I knew a lot of people. And mm -hmm. so people would know me as, as the rental queen. So they would just call me. Um, and so it was very easy to continue that business and generate that business. And when you have 150 or 200 owners um, and they're happy and they're satisfied and your, your satisfaction rate is high, they refer you a lot of business. And so a lot of that business grows organically without having to really work at it. So going into a new market center, it was, okay, where do I begin? And joining the board and getting involved in networking groups and websites and advertising and marketing and what works in this market that didn't work in the previous market. Um, there, there's Dallas a lot to learn. Dallas is pretty cutthroat from what I understand. Dallas is, Dallas is pretty intense. Um, there, and, you're looking at you know, flat fee management companies coming in at really, really low fees and they're trying to outshine everybody that way, you know, lead from the, from the bottom, as they say. That's true. That's true. And a lot of corporate companies coming in. Okay. So, um, you know, for the mom and pop to compete against a corporate company that has a huge advertising budget, a huge marketing budget, a huge lead budget, that's very difficult to do into a new market. Um, and also Dallas is just so big. You know, you've got Dallas and then you've got Fort Worth and some people cover it all. Mm -hmm. I elected to just work the Dallas side because it's just logistically too big to do both. But even in the Dallas side, I mean, when you look at it compared to San Antonio, they have um, 18, 19,000 realtors in Dallas. Wow. Um, double what San Antonio has. Yes. And the geographic area is double or triple the size of San Antonio. And so when you're looking at just doing something simple like networking, like with Women's Council, I was very involved in Women's Council in, in San Antonio, which has one chapter. You go to Dallas, in order to get involved in Women's Council, there are six chapters. Holy cow. So that's six meetings each month and six different groups to get involved with. And so it's a it's much more geographically spread out. And so it's it's a lot more work to get involved in those types of groups because there's just so many of them. So as a kind of a startup there again, so you're focusing in on them, on the owners, say, well, I'm customer service oriented. I'm your point of contact. I'm, I'm here for you. Uh, it's me versus, you know, you get a number of properties underneath you. It's like a team effort. Well, we do this and we do that. Mm -hmm. So you have to find what you are good at. Find your points of difference and accentuate those to the market. That's what you've had to do. Right. And it's, it's reverse for you, right? You've had to do a 180 in what you're, what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and going from having a team that does everything um, and running the team to being the one doing all of it has been a very big change as well. Um, for me, my goal right now is in looking at the, you know, my model and looking at, at what I'm projecting out for the next year, I will probably be able to have 50 properties under management, work from home with little to no overhead and make probably the same income that I made at 250 properties with a large team, a large staff, large overhead. Wow. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute, everybody. <laughs> they're like, they're all scratching their head out there in, in, in podcast land saying, how do the she, how, how, how? They're all drooling in themselves. Like, how does that work? Yeah. But it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense because that's really where the industry is going. There's so much pressure on the top from capping the top line revenue with all the, the big corporate entities coming in and pushing down the fees and the overhead as well, it's only gonna go up, it mm -hmm. seems like, mm -hmm. because cost of labor, cost of doing things, everything just seems to be going up. There's more and more subcultures of management companies that are doing exactly what you're doing. Uh, there's, there's a couple big ones in the NARPM listserv that we see. I'm not gonna really mention names, but you kinda know who I'm talking yes. about, some of them, mm -hmm. where that's their whole little, um, Again, it's like a subculture, but that's almost a negative connotation to it. It's like a, it's like a clique of small and wannabe small mm -hmm. managers who are laughing amongst themselves, <laughs> looking at the outside of the the other management companies out there, saying, "Y'all suckers are chasing the big dollar, but we're still making more percentage wise than you guys over there trying to get it a thousand homes." Right. So right. that's a, that's something to, to not be overlooked. Is at the end of the day, if you have a good lifestyle and you're making a good profit and providing a good service you're winning and laughing at the others trying to uh, chase that big nut. Yeah, absolutely. I think also it's really, really nice to be small because I get to be super selective on the owners that I take mm -hmm. and the properties that I take. And I have no desire to have 100, 200, 300, 400 properties. Um, I can have a, a very, very nice, comfortable lifestyle with a lot of beach vacations, mm -hmm with 50 really good properties that want to be in my portfolio. So let's dive into that just a little bit more so we can kind of 
because some of the crew out there that are listening to this are like, oh, wow, now she's talking about something totally different than mm -hmm. buying and selling. Mm -hmm. She's talking about that niche that just doesn't seem to be talked about enough is that staying small concept. So let's, all right, so let's talk about leasing. You do the leasing. I do the leasing. Right, you do some of the walkthroughs now and again. Uh, you do the, the maintenance issues, mm -hmm. right? Do you outsource to a 24-7 maintenance call center? Nope, I take but, care of all the maintenance but calls. But you could. I could. Yeah, there's there's, could. there's call centers out there that are fairly inexpensive to handle the, the night and the weekend calls. Right. So that's, that's a minor expense you could incur. Otherwise, you do online work orders and they submit online mm -hmm. and you handle it. You got a preferred vendor list. Yes. You talk to vendors. The vendors go out and do the, the maintenance. Uh, the tenants get ready to move out. You do the walkthroughs. You provide a, there's like going to be a walkthrough service or some sort of inspection service done, correct? Correct. So all that's being done, you do the uh, security deposit automation. You're getting that done. Mm -hmm. And you're re releasing the property again. Right. So that whole life cycle. In the meantime, you're, you're handling all the payments through the cloud. Yes. Right. So the management so company software, Software X, you're collecting in rent electronically. You're paying in rent electronically. Yes. You're allowing tenants no options to pay rent other than electronically. Is that correct? That's correct. So that's a key point. Uh, a lot of us are stuck in the mode of, well, they can just come to the office and bring us a certified funds. They can bring us cash. They can bring whatever. Uh, but you say, nope, you're only paying via electronic methods, period. Correct. And so most of the tenants are, are fine with that. Yes. So they pay rent in electronically. You pay out rent electronically. And any questions with the owners for the statements are available. Correct. So fairly simple process, yeah. right? We tend to overcomplicate things in management, but that whole life cycle we just talked about in a couple of minutes. Now, naturally, there are things that are going to come up. There's an HOA violation here or there. Okay, you deal with that. There's, there's a major maintenance issue here or there. Okay, you deal with that, mm -hmm. right? Because you're still the person that's available. And you can make that phone call and say that name again from the beach. What's that name? Punta Cana. Uh, I can't even say that three <laughs> times over. But Dominican you, Republic. <laughs> yeah, you're in the Dominican and you get a phone call on your mobile phone. There's a major water leak and you can still handle it from there. Correct. And sleep at night. You have a good conscience because you are on top of it. Absolutely. Right. And that's, I love it. I think that's going to be, that's a podcast in itself. We could sit here and talk about that all day long. And I think a lot of it is setting up the expectations with the clients that you're going to do everything electronically. They apply online. They pay their application fees online. They pay their deposits online. They sign the lease electronically. All of that gets loaded and they have access to it through their portal. Um, and we've, uh, you know, since I've moved to Dallas, I have taken advantage of the self-showing lockbox. Okay, great. That has been really revolutionary for me, uh, being a one-man office. Mm -hmm. um, so I am doing more internal leasing than I ever did in San Antonio. Um, I'm currently leasing 90% of my own properties. Which means you say paying out the leasing fee commission. Correct. That's the point. I don't right. want to glaze it over because uh, when you say that, some, some markets would say, okay, great, no big deal. But then, well, wait a minute, people. So she's not paying out 90% of those commissions. She's retaining that. Right. And she may have a leasing fee to the owner. There might be some sort of, you know, early termination fee that she's abiding by. But at the end of the day, leasing it yourself is a better concept. And that's something I think we don't necessarily do in this market, San Antonio, for example, right. as you know, because right. there's just so much co-brokering right. is the official term that other market centers, other market uh, places in the country call it, is co-broking. Right. There's more co-broking than anywhere else uh, here. And so you're doing more internal leasing. Correct. Which is fascinating. And when I put together my numbers and I said, okay, how many when I looked at how many properties do I really need to have? Originally, I said 100. But co -bro you know, not co-broking changes that dramatically. And I didn't realize how little of that I would be doing until I actually got up there and started working in that market. There was no way for me to, to know that. And the, um, the co-broking commissions that they pay out in that market are huge compared to what we were paying in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So it, it is a total set of revenue that, um, quite frankly, I underestimated significantly. So yeah. I took the, you know, just from the first three months of this year, I am over my entire year's projections. Mm -hmm. And so looking at that now, I think, wow, you know, this, um, 100, 100 isn't in the, in the cards anymore. 100 properties is not in the cards for me anymore. I can very easily do this and, and do it comfortably and be able to sleep at night and not have the stress of, oh, I got to call this owner back or that owner back because I'm too busy. I didn't get to them. 
to be able to give that really great service, take care of those clients, and and make a great income doing it. Right at 50 properties. At 50 properties. Wow, that's awesome. So some of the details I think they're going to be asked on this podcast is how are you doing the unassisted showing stuff? Talk us through the actual vendors and some of the boxes you're using. Um, well, uh, when I first started, I decided to go with Rentley. Okay. And I am in the process now of switching to Tenant Turner. Okay. Um, there are pros and cons to a, a bunch of them. I also looked at Showmojo. And thank goodness for NARPM because I was able to get those get in front of those people at convention and be able to talk to them and, and walk through that process. But, um, you know, the self-showing thing, I, I just didn't think it was going to be as big of a draw to tenants as it has been that the feedback because we get feedback on every one of those self showings the feedback has been unbelievably high uh, extremely satisfied from the tenants perspective of being able to go and self show the properties now we only use it on vacant properties right. and the owners sure have signed some sort of waiver the owners and, understand that or at least they know what's going on yeah yeah i that think that's the right procedure there we're managing that and you know because i wasn't real sure how the process was going to work i started out every property with two lock boxes mm -hmm. one for agent use to and, and every property goes in mls there is absolutely 100 percent opportunity for co-broking there just doesn't seem to be a large number of agents you know doing tenant representation in that Dallas area, and that may, that may be a whole other job market for people to, to tap into. But the the self-showing model has been, it has surpassed my wildest expectations. I thought maybe I'd have one or two people that might actually do it. There are days where I have five and six and seven showings on the same property through the self-showing lockbox. It's amazing. Um, in the property, I post the application criteria. I have handouts in the property for them to pick up. And uh, many, many times I will get the call as soon as they leave the property. They said, we picked up the flyer. It has the application instructions on it. We're going straight to the computer. We want to apply today. We want to move in, you know, ASAP. So it has cut down the amount of, of time in getting those, those tenants onboarded dramatically as well. They're not waiting for me to go show them the property. Which type of lockbox did you put on? The, I, oh, the secondary lockbox? Yeah. Combination lockbox. Combo. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is the, the one tied into Tenant Turner, is that a specialty lock box? Is it a it's a code box. Code box. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's mm -hmm. what I'm sure the audience is going to want to understand. So they, so you're using the, the, the formula is you're using Tenant Turner mm -hmm. with a code box lock box. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. And That's a secondary combination lock box for vendors, mm -hmm. locksmith, move-in, et cetera. We are doing all of our move-ins by, lo by lock box as well. Excellent. So, you know... The, the old theory of you have to meet every tenant, you have to, you know, have them come to the office and fill out the application. They have to come to the office and sign the lease. They have to come to the office and pay rent. Many of these properties, I have never, ever met the tenant. They applied online. They paid online. They signed their lease online. They move in with the lockbox. Uh, they may or may not be there for the periodic inspection, which would be my first opportunity to meet them. Mm -hmm. I would love to meet them, but it may be years before I meet a tenant in a property. Right. And that's okay. It's music to my ears because if you've been listening to my podcast episodes, uh, it's one of the things I've been preaching for a long time is that tenants do not need to come to the office. We have the same system set up here where they apply online, sign online, move in through a lockbox move in. Mm -hmm. And we're now in the process of perfecting the, the process of doing the unaccompanied vacant home showings. So phase one of that is we had to get everybody off of the 30-day rollover thing, mm -hmm. right? As you are well aware of, is that most uh, management companies are putting the home on the market 30 days prior to the lease ending. Right. Meaning you're showing a home with tenants inside right. the home. So you can't well, how, do self-showing. How well is our, our tenants going to show the home? True. Okay. And you cannot do unaccompanied self-assisted showings sure. when a tenant is there. So we first had to make policy changes that we're only going to show vacant homes. So we wait till the tenant vacates, do the make ready, then put the home on the market with pictures, fresh pictures, fresh video, put the home on the market. Now this is going to allow us the opportunity to start doing more of the self-assisted, unaccompanied, vacant home showings, which will rent the homes faster. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, because some of the owners may say, how is that going to rent the home faster? Mm -hmm. So in your experience using this, in reality, in the same Texas area market, it's renting the homes faster, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, so the homes are renting faster. Or do you think you're getting more for those homes because of the self-assisted showings? Um, I'm not sure that that 
plays into the self-assisted showings. I think you, you always have to be priced right, and you have to be ready to adjust that um, I think quickly. it does. I think it does, and here's how. Okay. So what happens when you don't rent that home after three, four, five weeks? You reduce it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But if you rent the home the first three, four, five weeks, you never have to reduce it. True. So you are getting more. Okay. Because you never had to go through the price reduction. Yeah. So as long I, as you're realistic with your original listing of course, price. Yes. Of course. Of yeah, course. Yeah, I would never plus up by $200 just because you do self assisted showings. Yeah. Because you still have to do the credit checks and all that stuff to verify they're good tenants. Correct. All right. Well, Amy, this has been a fantastic episode. Uh, the parts of the end really got my ears perked up. We're talking about the self assisted showings. I think that's going to be a market trend shift that more and more people are going to want to look into, especially hearing the, the real world testimonial that you're giving of not having to co-broke and it works like a charm because there's a lot of people that they've been in the business for a long time and they're just afraid of change. Oh, we can't do self-assisted showings. Too many refrigerators are going to go missing. Mm -hmm. Are any refrigerators missing at this point? We've had no refrigerators missing. Exactly. So the, the, the amount of incidents that you may have from that would far away the, the benefits and the, the cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So it's not even a consideration as far yeah. as, you know, put that into your planning mode. So again, great episode, Amy. Have any last minute comments you want to say to everybody? I would just say that um, if there are any property managers that are listening that are not members of NARPM, you need to become a member of NARPM. NARPM literally changed my life. Um, we were running a, a good shop and we were running a consistent shop before I discovered NARPM and got involved in NARPM. And once I got involved in NARPM and I understood, you know, how to make it even better and take it to the next level and become, you know, leaner and deliver better service and become more profitable um, and even, you know, offer some things that we had never even thought about offering before, uh, it, it really changed change the way we did all of our business. And so anyone that's listening that's not a member, that should be the number one thing you do immediately today. Agreed. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Amy. Thanks. Today's show has been sponsored by Virtually Incredible, providing tenant screening services, call center services, and video production services to property managers. You may also visit them at virtuallyincredible.com. This has been a podcast episode by propertymanagementproductions.com. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, leave us feedback, and come back for our next episode.